The scripture for this service is Luke chapter 1, verse 17. Luke 1 17. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Elder Yun Seogil and his family, thank you for testimony. Now, Senior Pastor will deliver a message, goodness number 16. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, and those who attend this service through the internet, and GCN viewers, this is 16th session of the series on goodness and the second lecture on the goodness of Elijah. In the last session, I explained that the first trait in Elijah's goodness was his humbleness in, the heart, in his heart, and that Elijah never quarreled with anyone, having no self-righteousness. Elijah may have seemed fragile in nature and indecisive, but God, who looks at man's heart, recognized Elijah's goodness in his heart and chose him as a great prophet of his time. By trials that God had allowed him to go through, Elijah became stronger and confident. And by manifesting God's wondrous signs and wonders, he brought the people of Israel back from idolatry to God. When Elijah had wholly carried out his God-given duties, God chose Elisha as his successor and lifted up Elijah to heaven alive. What happened to Elijah, who ascended into heaven on a chariot of fire led by horses of fire? I hope you can be touched by the utmost goodness of Elijah, not only on this earth, but also in heaven, and receive grace from him who resembles our Jesus, who came down to this earth, leaving all heavenly glory behind. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the second trait of Elijah's goodness was his love for God with his deeds and in truth. Elijah always communicated with God while he carried out God-given duties in this world. Elijah also struggled to clearly understand God's will that was laid out before him. As Elijah clung to God all the more in order to achieve God's great work with his weak and fragile temperament, God strengthened Elijah's spirit with the power from above. Through such experiences, Elijah yearned for God's power even more and also came to earnestly long for God who strengthened him by his great power. With his love for God, Elijah fulfilled God's commands with obedience, even when he felt he couldn't accomplish them on his own. We know how people of this, this world try to give everything for those whom they love. Even if things seem to be beyond their capability, people will nevertheless try. Yet, the love of this world is very and only temporary. With the passing of time and changes in surroundings, one's heart changes along with his deeds, right? Most people also like to receive as much as they have given. But, Elijah's love for God remained steadfast, and he perfectly demonstrated that the love with his deeds and in truth. Although many people confess their faith and love for God, when the time comes for them to accomplish the works that would delight God, they make excuses of their temperament and back away. They say, I want to do God's work, but since it doesn't suit my personality, I just quietly work on what I have now. 
But people you know, who say such a things must look back how much they actually believe in God from their hearts and how truthfully they love God. Our Father God has told us all things are possible to him who believes, and as long as their love for the Father remains fervent, temperament is not an issue. They cannot help but testify to the love of Father God and to our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about the time when such weak-natured Elijah single-handedly challenged the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah to bring down God's answer by fire. In his fervent love for God, Elijah became all the more desperate to save the Israelites who had abandoned God and embraced idolatry. And that's why he could be so confident and courageous. This is how one who truly loves God would act. And Elijah demonstrated that love with his deeds and in truth. Through this process, Prophet Elijah could understand God more clearly and laid the firm foundation in his understanding of God. When we reach the faith of the fathers, the mature measure of faith, we will come to know in greater detail about God, who has existed from the beginning. Even during his life on this earth, Elijah earnestly longed for God because the prophet had taken what he knew about God to the depths of his heart. How full of love his heart must have been for God when he was lifted up to heaven alive and beheld God with his own eyes. Elijah had understood about God in his own way, but once in heaven, the prophet came to clearly definitive realization of God, the Trinity. His heart, being sanctified without evil, he always prayed to God and entered into deep communication with God. This empowered him to contend with 850 prophets of Baal and of Asherah. Without communication with God, it wouldn't have been possible as he willed and intended. Being in close contact with God, he could figure out God's heart and did accordingly, thereby manifesting such a work. Elijah came to know all, not only the God the Father, but also God the Son and the God the Holy Spirit. Elijah also came to know the duties that are assigned to God the Son and the God the Holy Spirit. He learned that God the Son would have to come down to this, earth, this world to be the Savior of mankind. In order for him to be the Savior, Elijah learned that God the Son would have to put on flesh and eventually become an atoning sacrifice through his crucifixion. When Elijah was aware of these facts, his longing for the Lord became even more fervent. And he confessed, I will do anything for you, my Lord. Father God accepted Elijah's confession and gave him the responsibility of making ready the way of the Lord. Elijah, who had been lifted to heaven alive and had been with God, was to be born again in this world and prepare the way of the Lord. Our Father God's plan, which was fulfilled by Elijah in heaven, had also been prophesied by prophets of the Old Testament. Isaiah 40 verse 3 reads, A voice is calling, Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. And Malachi 4 verses 5 and 6 says, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. God proclaimed he will send Elijah. 
Where then would he send him from? From I mean, would God bring him out of the lower grave? No. He will send him down from heaven. So behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. God prophesied through prophets that he would send Elijah to this world again and what duties Elijah would assume. How could this kind of thing be possible? And when did God send Elijah back to this world? Keep in mind that this is totally different from the concept of reincarnation that Buddhism would teach us. And because this is clearly recorded in the Bible, I urge you to pay attention and understand the message well. An event of a man's being lifted to heaven and his being born again happened only to Elijah and has taken place only once in mankind history. How could Elijah, who was lifted out of life to heaven, be born again in this world? In order for a human to come into a being, God must send a spirit. Without a spirit, a man is no different from an animal. It won't actually happen. But let's say man clones human beings after a hundred years from now. Let's suppose it happens so. Because their spirits are not given by God, they may look like humans in appearance, but they are no different from animals. At the conception of person who was to make ready the way of the Lord, God included Elijah's heart in the spirit that he sent. God didn't send Elijah's spirit. He sent a spirit that contained Elijah's heart. Since Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the body of the Virgin Mary, he didn't receive anything from the biological parent's nature. Also, God's Spirit sent at Jesus' conception was the heart of Jesus. But things were a little different for Elijah. Since the Spirit that contained Elijah's heart was given after the seeds of life had come in a union, that person was to receive his parents' energy and their influence. So, among all the pregnant mothers whom God had considered to be good, he sent the spirit that contained Elijah's heart to the fetus of the one such woman. It was well prophesied in the Old Testament, and the Bible says the heaven sent Elijah back. And Elijah was back, and our Lord said in the Bible, he was the Elijah. So Elijah's spirit was contained in the sperm or in the egg that God sent. It was different from our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit himself. So it's completely different. However, Elijah had to come back. Elijah was lifted alive and his sins were cleansed. He was clean. He was just like, he resembled our Lord. That's why he was, you know, he could be uh, lifted alive. Uh, once you listen to the five levels of in the faith, then you can understand. Who do you think was the person born this way? There have been many prophets in the Old Testament and many disciples and apostles in the New Testament. But there is only one person whom the Bible refers to as a man sent from God. It is John the Baptist, found in John chapter 1, verse 6. 
And in many parts of the Bible are evidences of John the Baptist being the one who was Elijah's heart. Luke 117 says, And it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Gabriel the angel spoke these words to Zacharias, who was to be the physical father of John the Baptist, about the baby soon to be born. And Luke chapter 3 verse 4 also clarifies that John the Baptist was the man whom prophet Isaiah had prophesied about, whose voice would to make ready the way of the Lord. And above all, our Jesus said that John the Baptist was Elijah. When two of Jesus' disciples, Peter and James, witnessed Jesus' transfiguration and realized that he was the Messiah, they asked him in Matthew 17.10, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Here, they ask him out of their curiosity. Since the scribes studied and taught the law, they were well aware of the words of the prophets and also knew that Elijah must come before the Messiah. To their question, Jesus replied in Matthew 17, verses 11 and 12, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. He will be coming ahead of the Lord. Elijah will be coming ahead of our Lord and restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. He already came. Jesus is saying that Elijah had already come at the time. That Elijah already came and they didn't recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. Well, they beheaded him in the end, didn't they? So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. And verse 13 says, Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. Both the Old and New Testament have detailed accounts on him, right? From these verses, we can learn that John the Baptist was Elijah. Because Elijah would be returning to the earth from heaven, he was lifted up alive. And the reason that he could be lifted up alive was that he achieved a heart of whole spirit and was totally sinless. Some may say, all men have original sin. How could you say that he had got no sins at all? Well, to talk about the levels of faith, at the first level of faith, we cast off sins and then go into the second level. Then we cast off all works of flesh. We advance to the third level. And at the third level, if we do away with all the sins committed in minds and thoughts, such as in envy, jealousy, and hatred, which are sins committed in thoughts, we get into the fourth level which means we've cast off all forms of evil, right? Yet, even if you have cast off all forms of evil, there are things that remain. Through trials, God lets even the sinful natures lying hidden in your bones be revealed and be thrown away. That way, you can remove your original sins and become sanctified without any forms of evil. You reach such a state when the original sins are completely removed, right? This state is called the whole spirit. It is referred to as whole spirit, where your heart is wholly of spirit. Whole spirit is without blame or spot. So in the Bible, we are told to keep our heart, spirit, and soul and body which had been made blameless, preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God wants us to keep them preserved, complete, without blame, and that's what that's the whole spirit. It's without blame. 
In the fifth level of faith, it can be explained in more detail what it means to be without blame. For those, you know, who wonder, I got no forms of evil. What are the blameless which are blocking me from entering whole spirit? The explanation can be given in the fifth level of faith. What you don't see as blame could be blame, even though you consider yourself being without evil because you have frameworks formed in the truth. Some of you may have strong frameworks. Before those things are crashed, you cannot keep peace with all people. Only after such things are shattered can you keep peace with all people. So, if you are a man of whole spirit that God desires, how spotless and blameless you would be. Jesus, who is God himself in essence, is spotless and blameless, and he is the true light. Therefore, if the one Therefore, the one, you know, who was to make ready the way of Jesus, the true light, had to be pure and perfect. For our pastors or church leaders who lead the church members to better dwelling places in heaven, they shouldn't merely teach them with words. While your faith stays at the second level of faith or in the third level of faith, you cannot actually teach them saying, we ought to enter the third level of faith, and then the fourth level and the fifth level, can you? Without, a, without you know, not practicing the words, you end up teaching the words only as knowledge. You shouldn't do so. So pastors should diligently try to enter the fourth level and the fifth level of faith. If you only teach without getting into that level, as you just said, you are hypocrite. Hypocrites, hypocrites teach people without practicing the words. Therefore, to diligently instruct the church members with the words of God, it requires you to be at least the fourth level of faith, and then you have to come into the fifth level of faith. Only then can you instruct them on heaven, New Jersey, and the third kingdom of heaven, challenging them to enter such places, right? Otherwise, just as Jesus said, you would end up being hypocrites who, you know, learned the Moses laws, namely uh, the words of God, but didn't practice them while teaching people. There shouldn't be such people anymore. This is why Father God sent Elijah, who had accomplished the whole spirit and was lifted up to heaven alive back into this world. Another reason for God's choosing Elijah was because in his fervent love for the Lord, Elijah had confessed, I will do anything for you, my Lord. This conversation took place in heaven, and I am sharing with you what God revealed to me. So, when Father God commanded Elijah to go back to this world, he willingly obeyed with Amen. Because Elijah had experienced life on earth and enjoyed the glory of heaven, he knew very well what it meant to return to this world. But because Elijah's love for the Lord grew all the more as he thought about everything that our Lord was to experience, Elijah was not hesitant to return to this world of sin and evil, but instead received the command in joy and with gratitude. God considered Elijah's goodness as the utmost level of goodness because he demonstrated his love with deeds and in truth, not merely with his words. But what can we say of people today? When they first meet the Lord, they have a burning love for the Lord. In, a, in appreciation of His great love, many people say, I will do anything for the Lord. I will live by the word of God. Or they even say, I want to give all I have, even my life for the Lord. Well, I've seen a lot of people making such confessions. But only a few of them hold fast to the compassions of their lips through their deeds without, without changing their hearts. For example, God didn't ask them to go into some remote place and preach the gospel, risking their lives. But they couldn't even open their lips and share the gospel with people around them. 
God didn't ask them to give him everything they have, but people cannot even obey the command of giving him the whole tithe, a command that he had given to bless people. People who indeed love God not only obey and live by His word, but they also volunteer to take the lead in times of trouble instead of backing away when it comes to accomplishing God's kingdom. Just as a kettle full of boiling water steams, for people who earnestly love God, it is only natural for the love in their hearts to come out in their words and deeds. And they can do anything that can please Father God, whom they love. For example, how did Jesus, who never quarreled, never cried out, and whose voice was never heard in the streets, react toward the people who defiled the temple? John 2, verses 14 to 16 says, And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves. In the temple does not mean the interior of temple, unlike the sanctuary. People were not even allowed to go inside at that time, except for those you know, priests or the high priests. People were you know, selling oxen and sheep and doves in the yard located right outside the temple. Moreover, they were not selling things as in the worldly market. They were selling items to be used for the purpose of the sacrifices to God and for forgiveness of sins. Even so, our Lord didn't tolerate it. So when he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables, he made a scourge, of course, and drove all all them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables there must have been the buckets for coins right he just poured out the coins of the money changers he poured out their coins overturning their tables overturning their tables how enraged our lord was by nature he wouldn't conduct himself this way so this indicates how angered he was and those and the money changers seated and he made a scorch of course and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables and to those who were selling the doves he said take these things away stop making my father's house a house of merchandise John 2.17 says, His disciples rem remember that it was written, Zeal for thy house will consume me. It tells us how clean God's temple should be kept, even though they were selling oxen, sheep, doves, which were to be used for sacrifices to God. For, forgive, for forgiveness of sins, our Lord was enraged for they were defiled in the temple of God. So he made a scourge, of course, poured out their coins, and overturned their tables. His behavior indicates how enraged our Lord, how enraged our God was. Moreover, if there is quarreling, bursting out in anger, and uttering bad words or insults in this holy sanctuary of God, it cannot be tolerated as well. For this reason, since the founding of this church, God has warned us numerous times that we shouldn't speak worldly things about making money, have an idle talk, or speak words of untruth in the holy sanctuary. Of course, God is angered. He is displeased. Because Jesus loved Father God so much, he couldn't just stand by idly, saying his father's house defiled. Our Jesus was meeker and more humble than anyone. But because Jesus loved the Father, he could act so boldly like this. 
then who among us can use our personality or surroundings as an excuse in accomplishing God's work? There is a saying that goes in the world, love makes you blind. When you spiritually and fervently love Father God and the Lord, people around you or your surroundings are not a concern for you. You will only think of God's will and become eager to accomplish that will in any way you can. Dear brothers and sisters, since I first met God and experienced His love until now, my love for God has not changed. I've loved Him ever since I first accepted Him. I just loved God even though I didn't know who God is and that Jesus Christ is our Savior. So this was a more than a blind love. But as I learned the Word of God, attended worship services, read the Bible, and came to know who God is and who Jesus is, I developed deeper love for God. To the extent I knew about God, to the extent I knew who God is, and that Jesus carried out the cross to redeem us from sins, my love for God depended. Can you love someone without knowing him? We love someone depending on how much we know him. As for me, to the extent I knew about God and about our Lord, my love for them has deepened. Furthermore, knowing that God has repaired the wonderful place, heaven, and that we will be able to enter heaven, we have deeper love for God and came to love our Lord. In addition, we developed greater love for the prophets who loved God and greater love for the biblical figures. Also, you come to love those who love God. After seven years of suffering and illness, I tasted eternal life before death as God healed me at once by His power. Father God has since meant everything to me. And whenever I thought of the love of Jesus who died for me on the cross, I could be grateful in any circumstances. So according to the word of God, I didn't do what God told me not to do. I threw away what God told me to throw them away. I did what He told me to do, and I kept what He told me to keep. How dare I say something is difficult or I cannot do this as they are the commands of my beloved Father God. Because every command and word that Father God has given us is intended for our own blessing. We can do it all in gladness and gratitude. Even when His commands seem too difficult to obey, my love for Father God always enabled me to obey Him with Amen. In the last session, I told you that God called me to his servant if I found myself not able to obey at all, but finally obeyed him. If Father God spoke, I obeyed what was utterly impossible to obey. I obeyed anything if it was the Father's will. Since becoming his servant, I have proclaimed that Father God is all Father God is alive and Jesus Christ is our Savior. When it comes to give glory to God, I've obeyed his words regardless of what people said about me and regardless of threats I faced. There were so many people of jealousy and anger. So when they proclaimed the deep spiritual realm of God, you know, they called him in a hypocrite. They knew they would be called like that, but they couldn't but do it. He was faithful, but he couldn't do it anymore. So they, you know, you have to be sanctified all the more. You have to enter the fourth and fifth level by understanding those levels. That's why, even though other people criticize me, I cannot but proclaim it. But there are some people outside the church in the condemn about me. But I've never blamed them. I've never taken the responsibility. I mean, you know, I've never asked them to take the responsibility. I've never made an excuse. I only proclaim the will of God. And when Father God knows and when Father God keeps me, then that's it. And only Father God knows. And I also convey Father God's will to you. And that's it.
Many Christian media told me to sue them or fight back. However, I always tweeted back to their home with smile. I got no intention to fight. I got no intention for argument. I got no need to do so. In obeying God's word, I didn't think twice before going to countries where there were threats of terror or where preaching the gospel was prohibited. Like it is said, the perfect love drives away fear. No matter how fearsome a situation looked, in my fervent love for the Father, I could always go forth boldly and cry out with all my strength, always giving great glory to God in the end. As I went to those places, I didn't harbor any fear. I've never had such words or thoughts as, I'm scared. What if things go wrong? What, what if they arrest me and imprison me? I didn't even think, because it's been prohibited by law, if things go wrong, I might be imprisoned. Well, I didn't even need such worries. Nothing mattered, only if I could fulfill God's will, proclaim who God is, who Jesus is, and manifest His power. I didn't care whatever they do against me after that. Father God knows everything, and He is Almighty. Things may happen under His permission, unless God permits, however, even with a person with authority cannot capture me or destroy me even if they want to do so. So, that's a genuine Christian life, as our Lord said. There are people struggling with worries and concerns for tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, although they are not spiritual. Life or death matters, but merely fleshly matters. Our Lord tells us not to worry for tomorrow, but seek God's kingdom and His righteousness first. He tells us not to worry for tomorrow. And today has enough trouble of its own. I hope you have such true faith. And in accomplishing God's kingdom, I have always devoted my time, wealth, and everything that I had to Father God. Even when I had nothing to give Him, by faith I asked, received, and gave. If I could, I always wanted to give Him more. This is because I have exceeding love for Father God and for my Savior, Jesus Christ. And it should always be the same. As our Father gave us the great task of constru constructing the great sanctuary, I've been praying to accomplish it. Even though it is a huge task and it requires such a long time to be fulfilled, I've never resented God, saying, Father God, how could you let me bear this burden for so long? I urge you to keep in mind that when your love for Father God is added on to your faith in Him, you will be able to say, I can do anything, and demonstrate that love with deeds and in truth. Let me conclude this message, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. In the second part of the goodness of Elijah, I explain how Elijah loved God with his deeds and truth. Although Elijah may have seen the fragile in nature, the more she belonged for God, she, the more she longed for God, the more boldly she could proclaim God's will. Once she came face to face with God the Trinity in heaven, his longing became all the more greater, and he confessed that I'll do anything for you, my Lord. And Elijah perfectly demonstrated his love for God with his deeds and in truth. In the final session of the series on goodness next time, I will explain how Elijah continued to demonstrate his heart of goodness after he returned to this world. I'll wrap up the goodness series with the 17th sessions. I could continue with the goodness series because there are a number of whom of goodness. But I cannot put all of my time on them, so I will finish. With Elijah's goodness of love for God, we can learn that there is no need to make any excuses before true love 
도와주시지요. 그리고 로마서 8장 37절에도 그러나 And Romans 8:37 also reminds us, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. May each of you love Father God all the more and live every day and every moment amidst that love by attacking after Elijah's goodness of love. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Let's receive senior pastor's prayer for the sick on screen. Lay your hand on the sick part of your body. If you are not sick, lay your hand on your chest and receive this prayer for the desires of your heart. Hallelujah, Almighty Father God of love, please lay your hands on those who are receiving this prayer now. By transcending space and time, show your words to your children who are receiving this prayer on the internet and through GCN in brain churches and local sanctuaries around the world. Give them the faith to believe and drive away their negative thoughts and doubts. Drive away all their tests and trials. From head to toe, all entrails, joints, nerves, tissues, and cells, whatever the sick part may be, burn them with the fire of the Holy Spirit and with the original light. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command the enemy, devil, and Satan, all diseases, germs, and viruses, and infirmities, go away. May the light come. Scorch all the terminal and incurable diseases with the fire of the Holy Spirit and drive away all endemic diseases such as malaria. All contagious diseases such as cold, flu, and fever go away. Protect them from all kinds of germs and viruses. Heal them of strong, strong, heal them of stomach, lung, liver, breast, uterine, intestinal, and all other cancers, AIDS, leukemia, cerebral apoplexy, high and low blood pressure, diabetes, thyroid, heart and lung diseases, and women's diseases, and all inflammations, be cleansed and go away. Heal them of polio, stroke, arthritis, and herniated discs. Back pain, headache, neuralgia, and all other pains go away. Epilepsy, autism, depression, neurosis, and other mental diseases go away. All kinds of paralysis be loosened. You get up, walk, and leave. Let the eyes see well, let the ears hear well. Let the blind come to see, the deaf come to hear, and mute come to speak. Heal them of after effects of all kinds of accidents and fix their broken bones. Let the heat and burning sensation go away. Restore them from burns and let there be no burning scar left. All kinds of drug addictions, poisoning, and substance abuse go away. Let the dead nerves and tissues and cells be regenerated and bring the dead back to life. Give them the blessing. May you God, give them the blessing of conception. May you receive the blessing of conception. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command the enemy, devil, and Satan, and the ruler of the air, go away, and their servants also go away. Go away, you evil, unclean, false, and deceitful spirits, separating spirits and all forces of darkness. Loosen the bonds of wickedness. Darkness, you go away. May the light come. Father God, give them strength to cry out in prayer, to cast off sin, and to be sanctified. As their spirit and soul prosper, let all things go well with them, and let their family be evangelized. Protect them from all kinds of accidents and disasters, and bless them to lead a prosperous life without any problems. With the firewall of the Holy Spirit, with heavenly host and angels, and with your blazing eyes, protect all your children, their family, their workplace, and business. Give our students wisdom and understanding, and give them fervent passion to study hard. Keep their hearts and minds from the worldly things, and bless our students to love our Father God all the more fervently. Whether your children eat or drink or whatever they may do, let them do it all for the glory of Father God. Let them say, I met God, I experienced God, I received answers and blessings. Let them testify, testify with their lips like this. Father God, thank you. Be glorified alone. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.